to our Tuesday night class. Good to have you here tonight and those online as well. Hopefully you all had a good Thanksgiving weekend and uh, uh, as you know, uh, back to normal schedule until we get to uh, Christmas time and uh, now we'll begin announcing a special Christmas Eve service that we're going to have December 24th, again at 7 p.m. with special music, communion uh, and uh, all of that and then, uh, after that we'll uh, have a celebration at uh, Deacon Steve's house right after that that you're all invited to. So uh, if you would like to join us for that, please do so. Uh, but hopefully you can make it for the Christmas Eve service. It's always a beautiful service and a beautiful way to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, let's see. Uh, by way uh, of uh, a prayer request, do we have any other new prayer requests tonight? Anything, anything, anything? Any new requests? All right, we've got a couple. Uh, that uh, we'll keep on our prayer list from this weekend. We'll in certainly include those in our opening prayers. But if there's nothing else, uh, we'll begin. <coughs> All right, so we begin as we normally do with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves an opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1 9, the rebound technique that ensures the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. Will we name and uh, uh, cite any known sins that we might have committed since we last spoke with God the Father? And that does ensure the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and to glorify you through the study of your word, and also lifting up our hearts in song and in praise. And Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to worship you and to serve you. We thank you for all the blessings that you have provided for us this day, providing for our every need, both in the physical and the spiritual realm. We especially thank you now for the word that you have for us uh, to partake in this evening so that our souls are strengthened and we grow in our relationship with you and your Son, Jesus Christ, more and more each and every day. And Father, we ask that you continue to provide those blessings to us in the coming days as we continue to walk in your plan and glorify you. And Father, we pray for our overall church, that you be with it, that you have your hand upon it, leading and guiding all of those that are working in ministry and every member of our church, Father, provide for them. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together as members of a local body of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can serve and worship from this place and also uh, serve and uh, care for one another as we should according to your will. And we ask, Father, that you continue to provide for every need for our church so that we go forward uh, freely teaching your word and preaching your word, delving into the truth and witnessing the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for all the churches around our country and also around the world that are out there teaching the truth of your word of the son of your son Jesus Christ and we ask that you continue to lift up positive pastor teachers to teach that word stick to the truth and not be distracted by the details of life nor uh, the gimmicks of uh, the, the cosmic system to draw crowds and attention but instead continue to focus on your word so that the truth of your son Jesus Christ is known in the hearts of many we also pray for all of the congregations around the country, Father, that you lift up their hearts in positive volition to provide support for their local assemblies and their churches so that, again, your word can be preached here not only within our borders but also around the world. And Father, this evening uh, we continue to uh, pray for, uh, pa uh, we uh, have a first prayer for Pastor Job Martin, and we ask that you be with him in his ministry. We can ask for you. Uh, uh, guidance in uh, Amy's MRI uh, results that are coming today, and we ask that all goes well there. We thank you for Jim Baldazaro's uh, test uh, being positive and nothing uh, negative going on there. We continue to pray for Karen and her job search and also her faith walk, and we ask, Father, that you be with her and give her strength and guidance. Also continue to be with Ken and Jerry as they prepare for hot surgeries this month and next and uh, lead them and allow their s surgeries to be successful according to your will. We thank you for the travel blessings of Bianca and Khalil and their current uh, recent trip, and also Joe and Abby. And we also uh, continue to pray for Steve and his recovery, and also uh, that you be with uh, 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 Shannon, Abby, and Seth in their pregnancies, and that you continue to watch over them and allow all, all to go well, and the pregnancies to be successful, 
And again, bless us with um, new uh, babies in this world to glorify you. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we have gathered together. We ask that you lead us now to lift up our hearts in song and in praise. In Christ's precious name, amen. And Cheryl, you singing tonight? Oh, Terry. Oh, yeah, Terry. <coughs> And if you all rise, please. <clears throat> Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ. We give thanks. We give thanks. Thank you very much, and please be seated. <clears throat> All right, thank you uh, for the doxology and Terry for leading us through it this evening. Now let's turn our Bibles, let's go to the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9 we continue to understand our Lord's ministry of prediction. Uh, we have also the storyline that we uh, started on Sunday that we're going to finish up tonight and then get into the ministry of prediction in detail, where once again our Lord is predicting his uh, journey to Jerusalem where he would suffer and die. But as we are understanding the topics of chapter 9 in the sixth topic, again, which we started on t Sunday, was the casting out of yet another demon, as recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we can also see the parallel passages in Matthew 17 and Mark chapter 9. But really, this story was not just about exercising a demon, but it was about having greater faith within our lives and the refinement so that we can have greater faith. Because it's one thing to have a baseline faith where we say, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ, but it's another thing to believe upon him for every step along the way in everything that you do within your life with full, wholehearted faith and trust in him. And these people uh, demonstrated in this little example that they didn't have that full faith. They knew Jesus Christ was a healer. They believed he could heal. But really, did they understand that he was the Savior, the Messiah, that he was the Son of God? And did they really trust in him for all things? Uh, to exercise the power and authority that God had given to them, and also to be able to heal, as we see in this narrative. So, going back into verse 27, let's just read the context and... Um, uh, then we'll uh, get into the detail for this evening. But as we uh, uh, finish, it says, But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who... Uh, uh, actually, no, I'm uh, a little bit too far. Let me... What do I want to go down to? I want to get that up on the board. Yeah, I got the wrong... Uh, Got the wrong note up on the board there. <laughs> all right, that's why I'm getting uh, uh, messed up. All right, so uh, basically we are all the way down to verse 37, okay? So when we get to verse 37, we're actually on this. Uh, 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 yeah, it should be 37, not 27 up on the board. All right, so in verse 37, it says, It came about on the next day that when they had come down from the mountain, a great multitude met him. And behold, a man from the multitude shouted out, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And again, that's the analogy of Jesus Christ being the only son of God the Father who was sent into the world, who ultimately would die because of sin. And this boy was uh, on his deathbed, ultimately also being demon-possessed and almost being killed by this demon, as we understand when we compare the three Gospels. So we see a great analogy there of sin in this boy's life, again, the demon possession, that would lead to his death. Now in verse 39, it says, Behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into convulsions with foaming at the mouth, and as it mauls him, it scarcely leaves. 
leaves him. So every now and again, this demon would leave this young boy, but ultimately it didn't do it very often. That's why it says scarcely would leave him. And then as we note the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, it also says that he would throw the boy into a fire or throw him into water, trying to either burn him to death or to drown him and kill him off. Now in verse 40 it says, And I begged your disciples, I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. And again, the word dunamis is in view there, the power that God uh, gives uh, uh, to each and every one of us, the power and authority that also was represented when Jesus gave that power and authority to the disciples all the way back into chapter 9, verse 1, when he sent them out on their missionary journeys. We are assuming that at that time, these individuals were confronted with this demon-possessed boy, and they could not cast him out. That's why Jesus responds then and says in verse 41, he says, O unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Okay? And there's a command by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It says, And while he was still approaching, the demon dashed him to the ground, threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Then in the second half of verse 43, uh, uh, excuse me, 43 I'm going to uh, note that uh, later on in the service tonight. So I'm going to stop there and just continue on with the principles that we have before us. And basically, as Jesus Christ now is looking at verse 41, as it says, Jesus answered and said, O unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? <clears throat> You see, Jesus Christ is having a lot of disparage and disappointment at this point in time and a little bit of frustration as well. He had been healing people. He had been exercising demons. He had been raising the dead. He had been teaching and preaching fantastic things as the Son of God, telling them that He is the Messiah, the Savior. He is the Lord. But ultimately, they weren't believing in Him and doubting and doubting and doubting. And I love how Jesus Christ says after the man or the father of this boy came to him and said, I begged your disciples, but they could not do it. And as we said on Sunday, and as I said this evening as well, Jesus Christ gave them power and authority, dunamis and also excusia, power and authority over all the demons, yet they could not cast this one out. And when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we look at Matthew and Mark, and both of those Scriptures say that Jesus responded that this one can only come out by prayer. And then in Matthew, there's an added uh, 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 verse in there uh, that is not part of the original writings, but ultimately it's added there, and it adds fasting too, which is not part of the context. Somebody added that after the fact. So fasting is not the issue with casting out the demon, but prayer was. And as I said on Sunday, well, if prayer was the reason for casting out this demon, why didn't they do that? And why weren't they praying to God the Father before exercising their power and authority? You see, even these disciples get arrogant with the power and authority, the knowledge that they had of the Word of God, and they saw it as their own power and their own authority and failed to remember that it's power and authority that is from God. And try as they might to exercise this demon, it would not come out. And in that whole process, and again, we don't know the time frame. This could have gone on for days. Days and days and days this could have gone on. Never once they prayed about it. Even when they failed, and they couldn't do it, did they say, well, maybe we should pray to God about this. Maybe we should pray to the Father and at least ask, Father, why can't we do this? They didn't do any of that. It didn't come out because they didn't exercise prayer. Why? Because they had a shadow of doubt of faith in their life as well. So we saw the shadow of doubt in the Father's life uh, by calling Jesus a teacher, first and foremost. And then as the other Gospels tell us, they came to uh, he came to Jesus and said, If you can do this. And Jesus looked at him and said, If? If I can do this? What do you mean if? I absolutely can do this. Don't you know who I am? So again, we see a shadow of doubt. And any time we have a shadow of doubt in our spiritual life, it's going to ruin our spiritual life. The whole thing's going to crumble down because we're not going to have the true faith. And if we are doubting in God, as we know in our prayer life, and again, we could teach on the prayer life uh, all by itself just on this principle, but basically if we have a shadow of doubt in our prayer life, again, it ruins the whole prayer life. 
Again, we have to believe that God hears us. We have to believe that God will answer us. And if we have doubt in either one of those things, that I'm not worthy for God to hear me or that my problem is not uh, worthy of, G- of God to listen to it or uh, uh, God is too busy for me and so therefore he's not going to bother with my you know, petty petition that I have for him. If we have a shadow of a doubt, guess what? Yeah, he'll hear you because he knows all things, but he's not going to hear you with the content of ultimately answering that prayer. And then if we doubt in the prayer, if you can do this, God, I don't know, but if you can, it'd be great. No, shadow of doubt. And he's not going to answer that prayer just for that fact. Again, the grace of God may come around in that event, but even if that prayer is answered in the if statement category, like Jesus healed this individual, healed this boy, exercised this demon, but it was totally what? The grace of God that was in view, the compassion, mercy, and love of Jesus Christ. But what did the father lose out on? Blessings. He lost out on glorifying God with a true faith. And also the disciples left out on blessing and a true faithful representation of who and what God is through their doubt by not being able to exercise this demon and certainly not going to God in the the, uh, uh, process of executing the power that Jesus had given to them. That should have been the first thing that they did. Go right to prayer before they healed anybody, before they exercised the demon, and before they taught and preached. They should have asked for the power of God in their life in that situation. And we need to do the same thing. So here's Jesus up on the mountain with Moses and Elijah in their transfigured state in all their glory. Jesus Christ representing his kingdom as the king of kings and lord of lords in a beautiful environment. And then they come down the mountain, and what do they do? Descend into sin and unbelief. Jesus Christ ultimately is disappointed and rebukes the people as a result. Again, this perverted generation, this unbelieving generation. Do you not know what I am here to do? And then he says, how much longer do I need to be here? Okay, haven't we seen enough? And again, we even say that about our world. How much more does God need to do? How much God more does God need to see? Yeah, we're sinners. The world is sinners. It's not going to get any better. It's not going to change. What more does God need to do? And we ask ourselves that question sometimes. And the answer is a lot more, apparently, because he hasn't ended it yet. And the same for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wasn't ready to go to the cross right here and now. The Father's plan wasn't ready for him to go to the cross right here and right now. It was going to happen at a future time period because God had more for him to do. But again, Jesus Christ is showing that disappointment and discouraging uh, 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 attitude because of the unbelief of these individuals, especially when we compare it to the belief that the centurion had in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Again, that Gentile centurion, the Roman soldier, who had greater faith, as Jesus said, than anyone in all of Israel. He believed. He said, just say the word, my servant will be healed. Don't even have to come. Don't have to look at him. This guy wanted him to look at his son and, again, perform some kind of magic or, you know, blessing on him and then heal him. No, it doesn't work that way. God is all powerful. All he has to do is think it and it will be done. And you see, when we have faith that is great, we know that. And we know that for our life and we know that for the life of those around us. And we have to trust in that faith and rely upon that faith and exercise that faith on a consistent basis. So we see Jesus is running out of patience as well. Again, the unbelieving generation, the perverted generation, he is ultimately, you know, ready to say, I'm calling it quits, okay? I'm done with this charade, okay? Even though it wasn't his charade, it was their charade. I'm done with this, you know, this foolery. As and, and this is in the presence of thousands of people following him around from town to town. But he knew it was in the heart of their hearts. And he knew that some of them were believers, but many of them were not. And they just wanted to see the show and uh, the dog and pony show. They just wanted to see the healings and the miracles. They just wanted to have this miraculous leader come to the fore and be part of that. They wanted the king to come and restore Israel to its prominence and defeat the Romans. They were looking at all the wrong things. And Jesus knew the unbelief in their heart. Yet, as I said, in compassion, grace, love, we can add mercy to that as well. He commands the boy's father to bring your son to me. Bring your son here and I will heal him. 
And ultimately, Jesus did do that. And when he said, bring your son here, there was an interesting Greek word that is used here, which is prosago. And ultimately, this word means to deliver him up. Bring him here is how we could translate it, but deliver him up is the sense of what this word means. And in the classical Greek language, this word was used uh, for the occultic uh, uh, sacrificial offerings that they would give to the gods. Even in the Greek and Roman empires, they would use this word for this sacrificial offerings. So I find it interesting that he says, bring your son to me. It was as if God, uh, Jesus was commanding the father to bring your son to me as a sacrifice. And when you do, I will heal him. We know he wasn't going to sacrifice this because God is not looking for human sacrifice, as we know. And again, he uh, forbid the Israelites to, comm- uh, to commit human sacrifices in the law. But yet, well before that time period, we see an interesting aspect of Abraham and his son Isaac that we're going to note in just a minute. So why don't we turn in our Bibles to the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Let's go back to the Old Testament and look at Numbers 21. And again, uh, all of you should be familiar with this uh, passage. Uh, Maybe you're not, but you should be. This is one of the more famous passages. But if you're not, we'll go through it. Now, as we talk about this word delivered up, it's only used four times within uh, the New Testament, three times by Luke, and once in this gospel, twice in the book of Acts, and then Peter also uses it in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18, which we're going to note in just a minute. But before we get there, we understand that this reminds us of Abraham, where God asked him to sacrifice his only begotten son. Again, his only begotten son from Sarah. And hopefully you all uh, know the story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob being the fathers of Israel. Jacob then becoming Israel, the father of the Israelite people. But before all uh, Israel came about, we had Abraham and Isaac. But God had promised, what, both Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son. And through that son, God would build a great nation. Unfortunately, they didn't wait on God's timing. They showed a little unbelief too. And uh, Sarah asked uh, her maidservant, uh, um, uh, uh, what's her name? Hagar, thank you, Hagar, Hagar, just lost it for a minute. Hagar asked Hagar to sleep with Abraham so that ultimately he could have a son because Sarah was beyond the age of childbearing. And then Ishmael came to, to the fore. But it wasn't that... That was not the promise that God had made because he said through Sarah and Abraham, I will give you a son. But yet they tried to jump to the quick and have another. And Ishmael came to the fore. He was not the son. But then through Sarah and Abraham, God then opened up the womb of Sarah and allowed Abraham to uh, procreate when they both were beyond the age. And they brought forth a son, Isaac. And that was the only son that those two would have. And now God is commanding Abraham to go sacrifice his son to him. But what's this all about? It's a picture of what faith? Are you going to believe in my every word? Are you going to be obedient to my every word? Are you going to follow my every word? You see, Abraham was a very faithful individual, and he trusted and believed upon God, even though as all Old Testament saints had a mishap here and there, but ultimately, because we're all sinners, but predominantly in Abraham's life, he was a very faithful individual. And God tested his faith, as we see in Numbers chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Let's read that. Uh, In Numbers chapter 21, Oh, yeah. It says 22 in the notes. No, that's not right either. No, that's not what it is. What's the right one? Go to the book of Genesis. Let's go to the book of Genesis. I don't know why I put numbers there, but a couple of typos tonight. And it's actually Genesis chapter 22. Wow, that one's way off. All right. In any case, in Genesis, book of Genesis, chapter 22, 
Let me just fix it right now so you can put it up on the screen. Okay, that's better. All right, so in Genesis chapter 22, it says, Now it came after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering uh, uh, on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and rose and went uh, to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young, young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder, and we will worship and return to you. Notice the faith there. You see, God made a promise that he would have a son and that he would have a great nation through this son. All along, even though God uh, had told uh, Abraham to sacrifice him, Abraham is uh, projecting faith in the promise that God first gave him. And he knows that even though I go to offer this son to him, he will give him back to me because he's got to fulfill his other promise of creating a great nation through him. So you see, even though th these two things, uh, you know, cross and there is a juxtaposition here, as we could say, where one is a promise through the son, but now I want you to kill this son. He also had faith in God that he would have to fulfill all. So he either knew, as we're going to see in the storyline, God will provide another sacrifice or that he would raise his child to the dead and give him back to him. He had total faith in God that he would uh, be obedient to the word to save sacrifice, but he also was faithful knowing that God would have to fulfill his promise. That's why he says, we will return to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took it in his hand, uh, took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Now, if you also don't know this, this is also a picture of God the Father sacrificing his only begotten son. This is a picture of that sacrifice. But God did sacrifice his son, where we're going to see Abraham did not have to sacrifice his son Isaac. And I love the little thing right there, how Abraham laid the wood on Isaac, just like the wooden cross was laid on Jesus Christ for him to be sacrificed as well. It's one of those little tie-ins that's very interesting. All right, so he says, we will return to you. And then uh, in verse uh, 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 6, it says, the two of them walked on together at the end. Now in verse 7, and Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. He said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood, bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Again, picture Christ on the cross. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place uh, uh, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand is on the seashore and your seed shall uh, possess the gate of their 
enemies. And then uh, verse 18, it says, in your, And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. And again, because of the Jewish people and the Jewish race, if we bless the Jewish people and the Jewish race, God will bless us because we are blessed through them as God had promised Abraham. And we have to remind ourselves of these things. So in any case, as Jesus Christ asked the Father to bring his son before him in that occultic overtone of a sacrificial lamb that was being brought to the fore, Jesus Christ was almost reenacting this Abraham scene, but also, more importantly, the scene that he would commit where God the Father would sacrifice his only son upon the cross. And again, the fate that is shown in there. So as this unfaithful generation, as we're seeing in the Gospel of Luke, didn't trust, didn't believe, and had shadows of doubt all over the place, Abraham did not, and he followed through, and he did exactly what God had commanded him, and he knew that God would provide, and God did provide, just as we should know that God will provide, as God does provide each and every day. Let's turn back to the Gospel of Luke now and understand uh, more of these principles. But again, it's all about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's no coincidence that we see this here, where it talks about Abraham, which is a type of Jesus Christ, Christ upon the cross. Again, Abraham being God the Father, Isaac being the Son. Again, we have God the Father, we have Jesus Christ, the great sacrifice that they would commit. And now we see in Luke chapter 9 a same imagery or similar imagery as Jesus is also talking about what? That he's about to go to Jerusalem. He told the disciples uh, earlier in this chapter, he had a conversation up on the Mount of Transfiguration with with uh, Moses and Elijah about going to Jerusalem and what he would have to endure. And we're going to see in just a minute, he brings it up again with his disciples. So there's no uh, coincidence that this little issue and uh, a scene occurs while Jesus Christ is talking about his own work going to Jerusalem. Now this word prosago is also used, again that word delivered up, is used in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18, where there Peter tells us, for Christ also died for sins once for all, and the, the just for the unjust, so that he might what? Bring us to God. You see, bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And it's as if, because of the cross of Jesus Christ and His sacrifice, again, that was brought to God the Father, now He's going to bring you and I, who believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and bring us to the Father in a form of a sacrificial offering. Not that we are going to be sacrificed and killed, as it were, but basically because we're identified with the cross of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, Jesus is going to present us as him and as his great sacrifice before the Father. And really the fruits of that sacrifice uh, that have come into the world. So again, we see great analogy in this word, bring him to me, as Jesus Christ said. We see all kinds of analogy about the cross, the forgiveness of sin, and ultimately the results of those who would believe that we would be saved and have eternal life and be brought before the Father as a uh, a soothing aroma, which is another form of that sweet-smelling aroma sacrifice that they would commit in the temple, a sweet-smelling, soothing aroma before the Lord as a sacrifice unto God. But again, not our sacrifice, but Christ's sacrifice that we are now a part of. Now as we look at verse 42, in verse 42... There it reads, it says, While he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. Here we see the demon taking one more shot at this young boy. Again, one more shot to torment him, to, uh, to hurt him, to harm him, and also to bring harm to the father as well as he's watching all of this. Also, one more example of what he could do 
by possessing this young boy, even in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's kind of like the cross of Jesus Christ, where Satan is going to take one more shot at Jesus Christ while he's upon the cross, to embarrass him, to shame him, to try to get him to sin, so that he would say, forget it, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to die for the sins of the world. I'm going to come down and destroy Satan right now. I'm going to come down and destroy the sinner right now. You see, Jesus Christ had his last temptations, too, while he was on the cross. But yet he overcame them. And as it says here, he rebuked the demon and exorcised the demon and said, get out of that boy. And again, Jesus Christ fulfilled that work upon the cross as well as he rebuked Satan by paying for our sins and then being raised to everlasting life. But as we also see, now giving him back to the Father reminds us also of Jesus Christ being given back to the Father because of the resurrection of our Lord. We have this word slammed here. Again, the Greek word up on the board, regu numai. And again, uh, that means to break, to throw down, to dash, or to, uh, to the ground, as it says. We can find that in a few places in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But what we typically find this word used in is not the slamming to the ground or the breaking of it down, but in that analogy of the old wine and the new wine skins, or the new wine and the old wine skins. Remember how we noted that back in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. And that is important too. Because why? Jesus is about to do something special here. He's about to make this boy new. He's going to take the old individual that had the old demon inside of him, get that old demon out of him, so that ultimately he could have a new life inside of him and give him that new spiritual life, the new resurrection life as we call it, so ultimately he could go forward inside of God's plan. So again, this word for slammed being the old wine and the new wine skins, or however you like to say that, vice versa, uh, because we had the the both analogies in chapter 5. But basically, get that old demon out so this new boy could go forward. This new life could go forward without this type of corruption inside of him. We also see this other word, convulsions, which is a, a word that means cause one to shake, convulse violently, throw into a fit. This word is only used here in the entire New Testament. Again, it's one of those medical terms that talk about somebody that would have an epileptic type of seizure. Uh, So again, Luke is using his medical background to utilize uh, those terms in describing this scene. And he does it to give us the vivid understanding of how violent this demon actually was. But yet, even with all the violence of this demon, Jesus Christ rebuked him sharply. Again, he reprimanded him and said, get out of him. And even, uh, you know, in this rebuking, not just saying get out of him, but he's also basically saying and, uh, you know, sharply reprimanding him for possessing this boy in the first place because he should not be doing that. And ultimately, he was. But Jesus Christ saved the boy, he healed the boy, and at the same time rebuking the demon as it came out. And that demon had to follow what? The word of God. Had to follow the word of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus commanded him to do so, he did. And you know what's kind of interesting? Did Jesus pray before? Hmm, I don't think so. Just a little test here, okay? Isn't it interesting how he said this one can only come out by prayer? Okay? I don't see any prayer going on here, okay? (laughs) The other Gospels, uh, you know, uh, it it, it, uh, may allude to that, but basically we also know that Jesus Christ was in prayer with God the Father. But again, it wasn't about the prayer. That's the point I'm trying to make. It wasn't about the prayer. It was about his trust in God, his faith in God, and knowing that it, you know, in his humanity, it was not his power. Yes, as deified God, Jesus Christ, it was his power. But remember, Jesus Christ was utilizing the power of the Holy Spirit through his humanity to perform many of these miracles, signs, and wonders. So again, it was recognizing where the power came from and the faith involved, and the demon came. Again, because he is God, again, the demon had to 
had to be uh, uh, commanded by him and had to obey him just because he was God. But uh, that may be uh, some of the reason why Jesus didn't pray here. But we also recognize the faithful nature of our Lord Jesus Christ in comparison to the d- other disciples who weren't faithful when they were out trying to exercise this demon. But Jesus Christ was 100%. So this all completed when he exercised the demon and gave him back to his father. It completed the analogy of the Abraham Isaac sacrifice that God had commanded. When God gave Isaac back to his father, Abraham, just as Jesus Christ gave this boy back to his father. And as Jesus Christ was also given back to his father after the sacrifice through his resurrection and ascension where Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, seated upon his throne at the right hand of the Father. So again, we see that great analogy of Abraham and Isaac in this scene when Jesus Christ said, bring him to me, kind of that sacrificial type of offering, uh, a young boy, not that he would be sacrificed, but ultimately a picture of what Jesus Christ would do for him and all of mankind. All right, now let's look at verse 33. It says, and they were all amazed at the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, and again, uh, we'll get to that verse in just a minute. But the point that we uh, want to understand here is that the people were amazed and they marveled. And they praised God. They praised Jesus Christ for this. Actually, in the next verse, we're going to see uh, a word. It's actually going to start a new section for us. But we're going to see another word that also talked about their praising of God, recognizing that the power that Jesus Christ was demonstrating could only be from God, which is a great thing. The people were blown away. They were marveling at Jesus. They were amazed at what he was doing. And that's the same attitude that we should have in our lives as well. We should be amazed at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ every day. We should marvel at him each and every day for what he has done on the cross alone, but also what he does in our life uh, every day. And especially as we delve into his word, as we're doing tonight, and you see how the word of God holds together from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. And you see how these analogies, as I just gave you, of Abraham and Isaac, this young boy here, Jesus on the cross, how it all is speaking of one thing. It's amazing when you look at the Word of God and truly understand it. And it just blows the mind away. And that's what was going on in these people's lives. Their minds were being blown away. And this is also wonderful because... We just read a story in the previous chapter of Jesus going onto the other side of the Sea of Galilee, exercising a demon, and the people did what? They told him to get out of there. Get away from us. We don't want you around here. And they were more of a Gentile race mix. We don't want you around here, Jesus. Get out of here. Please leave. And he did, as a gentleman would. But these people were amazed. And again, they were coming to recognize who and what Jesus Christ was, and they were coming to faith as it it were. But yet Jesus Christ had this great power that he displayed, overwhelmed the crowd, uh, also demonstrating his greatness, as it says. And again, we have the Greek word megaliotes, and basically great, you get that word mega from, okay, but the greatness of God. We see that here in Acts 19.27 and 2 Peter 1.16. The only time that this word is used in the New Testament. And it proclaims how great God is. And so as Jesus Christ was doing these wonderful things for these people and giving them these great lessons on faith, they were proclaiming his greatness over and over and over again. And we also see that as we look at 2 Peter chapter 1 in verse 16. It says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Peter speaking. He says, But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Remember what this verse is? We showed this to you earlier. This is not today, but <laughs> about a week or so ago. This is the verse that talked about the transfiguration. And so when he's saying we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, that's the transfiguration. When they saw Jesus Christ in all his glory, when they saw his majesty, when they saw his kingdom, as Jesus Christ promised that some before they died would see the kingdom of God. 
And so again, we see his majesty, his megaliotes, ultimately on display in that transfiguration. But not just in the imagery of who Jesus is and the bright shining clothing that he was wearing and the bright shining epidermis that was coming forth from him, but more importantly, in his work and in his word. That's the glory of God in what he does for us each and every day. One thing to look at him is this all glory, you know, bright, brilliant light, and wow, look at that, isn't that awesome? But it's more important to praise and worship God for what he does for us each and every day through his word and through his works. And so again, that's what Peter is reminding us of in that passage, the majesty that we saw on display in the transfiguration, but now we see his majesty on display in his great works and in his word. All right, so now we're moving on to another section, the next section, which is our seventh topic in chapter 9. And here we have another prediction of his crucifixion. That's the second half of verse 43 all the way through verse 45. And then we also have this paralleled in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, 22, and 23. And then the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 32. So let's read those passages now. Again, verse 43 says, And all were amazed at the greatness of God. Then it says in the second half, But while everyone was marveling at all he was doing, he said to his disciples, and then in verse 44, Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement. And it was concealed from them, so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. I'd like to jump on that last part first, but I'm going to save it for a little bit. Why wouldn't they ask him about this statement? If they didn't understand something, why wouldn't they ask? That's what I don't understand, okay? Why wouldn't they ask? Just as they couldn't exercise a demon, why didn't they pray? Now they don't understand what Jesus is saying, why don't they ask? But they don't. Very interesting uh, and Uh, 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 kind of the trap that they were in and the mentality of their soul that sometimes we can get in, that we have to break through and make sure we don't, uh, you know, uh, limit ourselves and our spiritual walk because of getting involved in that type of trap. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But again, the people saw the miracle that Jesus was doing, but Jesus wanted to do what? Jesus wanted them not to see the miracle. He wanted them to see the cross. And that's what you and I saw. You see, when we looked at this, we said, ah, wait a minute, there's some things going on here about this uh, exercising of this demon that have to do with faith. There's some things going on here in regard to the resurrection life. There are some things going on here in regard to Abraham and Isaac, and that all does what? Points to the cross. You see, that's how we should be looking at the Word of God, that it all points to Jesus and the cross. That's the epicenter. We need to look there as well. That's the backbone for everything that God does in our lives. And so as these people were praising Jesus Christ for the great miracle that he had done, he pulls his disciples aside and says, you know what? I just did this miracle. The people are praising me. But you know what? I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be delivered up into the hands of men. And he wanted them to see the cross. He wanted to see the greatness of the cross. And as Jesus was saying this, he equated the majesty of God and the amazement of the people with what? The crucifixion. You see, that's what we ought to be amazed at. Not his miracles and the signs and the wonders. Yeah, we can get pretty amazed at that. But you know what? The cross is so much more amazing because of what it accomplished for all of mankind and for all of the angelic kind as well. That's what Jesus Christ was trying to teach these individuals. It's all about the cross and what I'm going to do for your sins upon that cross. All these things that I've been doing, healing people, exercising demons, uh, raising the dead, etc., etc., all these things, it's all because of the cross, and they're all pictures of the cross. Because sin has come into the world, and that's brought illness, sickness, death, Satan and his cosmic system, which led to possession of some individuals. The cross rectifies all of that for the life of the individual who does believe. 
You see, not only was Jesus here to heal and cure from these things, but ultimately to suffer and die and ultimately be raised and be returned back to his father uh, upon his resurrection and ascension into heaven, where now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father in all his glory. You see, Jesus wanted them to see the cross. That's why he goes off and tells them this right then and there. It almost seems very immediate that he just turns from this scene now to that scene. And what does Jesus say in verse 44? It's kind of interesting how he says this. Let these words sink into your ears. And that's kind of an idiom, and that's why it's somewhat uh, of an idiom in the English language, sink into your ears, okay? Basically, it means learn something and learn it well. That's what's going on here. As you hear it through the ear gate, as we call it, as you hear the word of God, let that word sink into your soul. The Greek word there says, let it be placed in your soul. And what does that mean? It means to be stored and retained. In other words, remember these things. Remember, remember, remember. And it's interesting that Jesus is saying, remember, remember, remember. But we also read, they didn't understand what he's talking about. Okay? And so it's kind of one of those things where it's like, Remember this concept that I'm giving to you. You might not be able to apply it right now and today, but there's going to be a day coming when you're going to be like, oh, (laughs) that's what that means. That's what this is for. That's what that word is all about. Now I remember. Again, the light bulb goes off, as we say. So again, remember these things. Let it sink into your ears. So he wants them to learn, to learn well, and then to remember even though they did not have understanding at this point in time. But as we know, after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, they knew these things, and they knew it very well, because they did remember. And Jesus now is predicting for the third time that he's going to Jerusalem, and he's going to suffer, and he's going to die. As I said, the first time he told them directly, previously in chapter 9, Then when he was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was speaking with Moses and Elijah about the very same thing. Now we see him for a third time, I'm going to Jerusalem. It's kind of interesting how we see these three uh, discussions all around everything else that's going on. Because that's what it's all about. It's about going to Jerusalem. It's about going to the cross, paying for our sins. He uses that familiar phrase, that son of man, which again is a deified terminology for the Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks to that he is God, even though it says he's the son of man. This was a a, a terminology that uh, was well known to be the person of God, the Christ incarnate, as it were. And it's also a favorite title used by Luke in his gospel. And he's going to be, again, this is going to happen. And what is he going to be? Delivered up. He's going to be delivered up. And that's the word para didomai. Okay, it's a compound word. Didomai by itself means to, uh, uh, again, to to have and to hold or even to take. But then para, again, that all, all encompassing is around it. So again, delivered up. And basically, this has two definitions as it's used within the New Testament. One and especially we're going to show you the Gospel of Luke, it means a transfer of responsibility, and two, it's a word that means betrayed. And it's used both ways, and both ways in regard to our Lord Jesus Christ. In the first sense, to transfer responsibility, this is what God the Father is doing with Jesus Christ. He's allowing Him to be delivered into the hands of men so that our sins could be transferred unto Him. And again, we see this transfer of responsibility in Luke chapter 1, chapter 10, chapter 12, and chapter 23, as I have up on the board. And the last one, 23, 25, it says, He released the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And that's when Pontius Pilate brought out that guy Barabbas, who was a murderer and uh, insurrector. And he was accused and found guilty of both. And he should have gone to the cross that day. But because it was Passover, Pilate came to the people and said, I'll give you a favor, I'll release one man. Again, going back to the ancient Israelite ritual of the scapegoat. 
Two goats brought forward, one goes free, one goes and is sacrificed. That's the picture that God was uh, displaying here. And there was a transferal here, a transferal of responsibility. You see, Barabbas should have died that day. He was a true criminal. But the people said, release him and crucify Jesus. There was a transfer of Barabbas' sin, of murder and insurrection, now given to Jesus Christ, who was an innocent man. And he went to the cross and died, not only for Barabbas' sin, but the sin of the entire world. You see, delivered up, that has that context of what God did with Jesus Christ. This word is also used for betraying in Luke chapter 21, 22. And in, uh, a lot of verses in chapter 22 as I get it up there on the board. And then in Luke chapter twenty two forty eight 48, it says, But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And all those other verses also are talking about Judas going through the process of betraying Jesus Christ, going to the chief priests in the Sanhedrin to cut a deal to betray him. And then Jesus talking to him about what you have to do, do now. And before that, he also prophesied, one at this table is going to betray me. Same Greek word. So again, as Jesus says to be delivered up, he's talking about it from both perspectives. From the perspective of God the Father, the transfer of responsibility of sin to Jesus Christ, and two, how that would come about through a betrayal. And the betrayal of Judas Iscariot, as we know, that was culminated in the Garden of Gethsemane in, the, in that night. So uh, when Jesus Christ says he's going to be delivered up, he's talking always about the cross. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to go into the hands of men. And we see him going into the hands of the chief priests. We see him going into the hands of Pontius Pilate. He goes into the hands of Herod, then back to Pilate, and then back and forth between all of them. We see him being betrayed by man. We see him being delivered up into the hands of man. And we see him being crucified ultimately by the Roman government at that point in time. Then as we look at verse 45, it says, But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them, so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. And I'd just like to say, Luke gives these guys a pass, okay? He gives them a big pass here. And, oh, it wasn't their fault. It was concealed from them. And the way he presents it is as if God the Father put blinders on them so that they could not understand these things. But yet, when you read the other two Gospels, no, nope, the gloves are off. <laughs> Points the blame squarely on the disciples. And it talks about their ignorance. And, you know, for many different reasons. You see, they continue to not understand what Jesus was really talking about. Nor did they ask him in a question about it, because they were afraid. What would they be afraid of? What would they be afraid of? Well, one, as I've gotten the notes, I've given you several examples. We don't know. It doesn't tell us all. But one, what happens right after this, this passage? The next passage says they're fighting amongst each other. Who's greater? I'm the greatest of the, all the disciples. So if anyone asks a question right now, that would show their weakness and their lack of understanding. They wouldn't be the greatest. So you see a little arrogance in there. We also understand that they wanted Jesus to come back and be the king and the savior of Israel, overthrow the Romans. But they kind of knew that that's why Jesus wasn't there. And they were a little bit afraid to ask because they didn't want to hear an answer that they didn't want to get. Okay? They wanted one way to they wanted to go in one direction, but Jesus was going to go in a different direction, and they kind of knew that too, so they were afraid to ask. So again, we see a lot of different reasons, maybe shame, embarrassment, maybe guilt, lack of understanding, lack of knowledge. As we look at the other epistles, excuse me, uh, gospels, as we look at those gospel accounts, it squarely puts their unbelief on their what? Ignorance. And it puts their lack of understanding on them. And that can happen to you and I as well. You see, if we're afraid of something or the answer that we don't want to hear, and therefore we don't ask it, again, we're cheating ourselves. And there could be many different reasons why we don't ask a question. But unfortunately, they're all what? Self-centered, typically. 
We're self-centered. And there's something in us that we don't want to change, or we don't want to have a difference, or we don't want to hear a different answer, or we don't want to learn what we really should be doing, because we know we should be doing it, but we're not. But we don't want to ask because we don't want to do it. So we don't ask, and we think, well, if I don't ask, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's not a problem. It's not an issue. And you know how they say ignorance is bliss? Okay. If you don't know that you're supposed to do something, well, you're all happy and you're all good. But when you know you should do something, it's not all happy, is it? Because you know you've got to make a change. You've got to do something different. You see, all of this is going on. You know, there's 12 disciples here. They could all had 12 different reasons for doing it, but they all were somewhat self-centered, being afraid to ask for whatever reason. And again, we should never be in a place where we're afraid to ask the question. And again, the truth sets you free, as the Word of God tells us. And when we ask a question, we are hoping we're going to receive the truth. And when we receive the truth, that is going to set us free, even if it means I have to change the way I've been doing things or the, how I function or what I think or what I th uh, you know, uh, uh, my understanding of what the future holds. Again, we need to go with what the truth tells us apply it and then we'll be set free but if we stay in a, a position of ignorance like these guys did they're not going to be free and peter was in a, pa a state of ignorance and he did what he denied jesus christ three times and ran from him all the disciples ran that night when jesus came and was arrested so again these individuals, in all senses, were operating on their emotional revolt of the soul. They were allowing their emotions to take over. And they weren't using the wisdom and the knowledge of the Word of God and Bible doctrine. They weren't faith resting in that to go forward. Instead, they were worried about what might happen. And again, that word, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know we, we get phobia from it, uh, from the Greek word. But again, they had a phobia. They were afraid to ask. And this isn't a phobia that meant respect and awe of Jesus. No, there was something going on with their soul. And so, again, we take two principles from that. Again, we must keep our emotions in check so that they don't overrule our soul. And when we keep our emotions in check, now we can learn. Now we make ourselves open to the Word of God. Now we can hear the Word of God. You see, their emotions were running rampant, Jesus said, learn well and remember, but they didn't understand, they didn't comprehend, because something else was going on in their soul. And so we too need to keep our emotions in check so we can learn the Word of God and understand the principles and be open to hear what that Word has to say. And then sometimes we get ourselves into a position where we're playing church and we're afraid to say or do something. Because we don't understand or we don't know something. And therefore, we don't ask the question. And we just keep going along, going along, going along, going along. But we never stop to ask, why? Why am I doing this? And what does this mean for me? So again, we should not operate in a, a, a stance of ignorance. And again, the Greek word for their not understanding is ag agnoeo. And again, it comes from the, the root word gnosis of knowledge, but you put the negative A on the front of it. They had no knowledge. They had no wisdom. They had no understanding. And it was due to ignorance. And yet they didn't ask the question. <laughs> so again, a little bit of lack of faith. They didn't pray. Now they're not asking questions. What's going on with these guys? Again, it wasn't their time. And the other aspect now Luke brings into it, it was concealed from them. You see, if we're going to operate in ignorance and if we're going to let our emotions rule and lead, God's not going to break through our sin nature and say, okay, even though you're operating in the sin nature right now because you're afraid or you're worried or you have anxiety or you're too self-centered, he's not going to break through that and say, well, I'm just going to tell you what to do anyway. No, it doesn't happen that way, okay? Again, God doesn't come to us. We have to come to God. And we have to go to Him in the confession of our sins and then the learning of His Word. 
And we have to put ourselves aside in faith and trust so that we can hear the word of God and remember the word of God as Jesus was commanding these individuals. And then as we understand, uh, we should not be afraid of asking questions about who God is, what his word is. Again, if we are seeking God, we'll have plenty of questions. We're going to want to know about who he is and how he operates. And the more we know about him, the more we are going to love him and the greater relationship we're going to have with him as well. But if we're not asking questions, and if we're not searching the Word to answer those questions, again, we're not going to know God and Jesus Christ the way that we should. And then as we also understand, we are to ask God in prayer if we need to, which we always do, ask God to know Him better. And that's what James chapter 1, verses 5-8 through eight is. If you want to know God better, ask God to allow you to know Him better, to show Himself to you. And if you ask with a truthful and a faithful heart, he's going to say, yep, here I am. And he's going to show you. He's going to give you all the information that you want to know so that you're not ignorant, you have understanding, and you go forward glorifying God to a maximum within your life. All right, so uh, we'll close there, and we'll pick it up uh, with the great argument about who's the greatest on uh, Thursday night. All right, so we'll see that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for this great object lesson that you have given to us, and also learning from the mistakes of others, Father, and help us to learn from those things so that we don't follow in the same mistakes, but ultimately uh, increase our own personal faith and knowledge and understanding of you, just as these disciples did, except for Judas Iscariot, in their own personal walk. And so, Father, we thank you for this time. We ask for your travel blessings on the way home this evening. In Christ's name, amen.